good afternoon and good morning wherever you are in the art world. We are delighted to welcome Mariam Eisler and Harry Lomayer for our new Brave VR Art Talk magazine issue. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm glad thank to be you. here. <laughs> so Mariam and Harry, we, we've, you know, Francois had this wonderful, uh, was inspired who cannot be inspired by your pictures, but we, he curated uh, your picture in a dialogue with the two of you, even though you're friends, uh, but you know, we, we thought that was a beautiful, fascinating idea. So we would like to, that's why you are here today with us, to, have, uh, to, to understand why maybe, and uh, why not. Uh, and one wet question that I would like to, uh, to ask you both, what brought you, you uh, to photography as uh, your artistic expression? Mariam, please. Sure, sure, sure. Delighted to be here as ever. Um, photography for me has been part of my life since, um, since I was a child. My father was a big aficionado and I was literally surrounded by cameras, you know, growing up all the time. He, he loved it. He loved the, the act of production. He loved all the, always the latest and greatest, you know, um, gadgets and, and photos. And then as I grew up in Iran and the revolution happened and we moved to Paris, um, you know, on, on the one side, on the one, you know, one front, there was all this sort of um, ambiguity regarding the situation and securities that, go, that went with it. But of course, growing up in Paris and, you know, the, the gallery scene, the art scene, the museums were just incredible. So I spent a lot of weekends going around with my mother growing up in Paris. And it just so happened that photography really was something that struck uh, very heavily. We, we did a lot of galleries and one particular show um, really was very relevant in my life um, that I saw was the Man Ray show at the Centre Pompidou. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that I really felt something very powerful with it. And then it just took off, you know, on its own. I, I never chose an artistic career to start off with, but, um, you know, photography accompanied me throughout my life. In, in both from a passionate perspective, you know, on the side, you know, hobby, weekends, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through to actually taking it very seriously for the last 20, I would say 22 years, 23 years, um, and, you know, continuously trying to improve, using my kids as models to start off with, my own family, my own <laughs> reference, um, but, but taking workshops, very serious workshops, whether it was, you know, Central St. Martin in the evenings, a school in, in London, whether it was Brooks Academy in California. Um, I continued Santa Fe workshops in, in New Mexico. It just went on and on and on, you know, throughout the years. And and um, I did a few books on artists and their studios. And throughout that process, I visited something along the lines of perhaps 550 studios in five years, of which many were photographic studios. So really my my um, the, the, the technical know-how, if you may, has just been sort of developed through underground, um, you know, visits, discussions with artists, discussion with photographers, and just doing it a little bit on the side without really being very public about it until by fluke, literally by fluke, eight years ago, a friend of mine who's a, um, an art advisor was visiting. I had just come back from, from New Mexico, funnily enough, and she saw this, uh, these prints on the floor of my living room and said, you know, who have you bought? And I said, no, no, it's, it's nothing I've bought. This is my own work. And she said, what do you mean it's your own work? And then, you know, next thing, you know, a week later, a gallery called me and, and then my wings were unclipped. You know, I owe a lot to um, the first gallery who showed my work, which was Kristen Hoare. And I, I owe Tristan a lot for having given me this opportunity to start off with. And ever since then, you know, I've shown a lot all over the world and it's been um, it's been an amazing experience, really. So so that's really kind of been a little bit the journey. And I also think photography at the end of the day is a form of guttural expression. It's you, you, you just you, you, you show what you feel and it's very immediate. There's an immediacy and satisfaction and an also immediacy in almost photocopying the artist or my, you know, mindset um, or sharing that, that, that photocopy of that instant, of that moment with the audience. Uh, so it's very sentimental, it's very guttural, it's very uh, feeling based. And, um, and it's got more to do with feelings than the psyche, I think, but that's for others to, to discover. 
beautiful words. As you, you said once, you eat, breathe, and uh, photography. And it, yes. <laughs> I, I do. I do. I'm, I'm continuously on the next project. I'm continuously thinking about the, you know, the next research or, you know, it always starts with a line of inspiration, uh, a movie. Um, at the moment, I'm obsessed with Il Gato Pardo, you know, the, the, the movie. It's my it, it's my <laughs> it's really, you know, like thinking yeah. about how to get myself to Palermo into that palazzo and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of, you know, yeah, referencing and, and funnily enough, a lot of my referencing, whether it's literature or whether it's poetry or whether it's movies or whatever it is, is continuously based in the 60s and the 70s. I have this very visceral connection to those two decades. Um, and I find a lot of beauty in, th in those two decades. So that's that's been a great source of inspiration for me. Thank you. Thank you, my beautiful, beautiful words. And what about you, Henry? Um, well, I, I think... Uh... <laughs> This is what I, I enjoy about hearing about Miriam and her experiences because, you know, there's it's uh, it's so different from mine. Um, and I learn a lot from her in that regard. Um, I, I've always been artistic in terms of needing to express myself. Um, I remember my mom not letting us uh, uh, use coloring books. She insisted that we use blank pages uh or paper you know um to express ourselves uh i i was always intrigued by photography um mainly because my father and he wasn't a photographer in any stretch uh he was a horrible photographer uh he would uh he would photograph uh you know he, we were the proverbial kids at the top of the stairs waiting to come down for christmas and he'd get the he we had one of those polaroid film cameras and uh pull you know pull film and uh, we'd have to go back up the stairs. We'd come down, we'd just see our, our presence, and then we'd have to go back up. Um, but my first camera he, they actually bought me was one of those Polaroid SX-70s or something like that. And um, we would just blow through that film, uh, just taking nothing. But I immediately, looking back on it, I don't know that I cognizantly thought, you know, uh, considered it then, but uh, it was, I, I could see it now being a real form of expression. Um, the reason I'm drawn to it in, you know, currently, when I say currently in the last 12 years or so, um, is, um, uh, well, I will ask me, uh, that I got out of, uh, I, I needed a form to express myself. I needed something to do. I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Um, I had gone to art school. Uh, and I always saw myself as wanting to be a sculptor or a uh, printmaker. Um, but when at this point in my life that, you know, 12 years ago, I, there was no way I could afford it. Uh, I was drawn by to photography simply because it was cheap. It was inexpensive. It was digital. It cost me nothing. I had, a, I had an iPhone. Um, and uh, I did that for, I don't know three years before I bought a camera um, that actually, you know, was a camera. Um, I still use the iPhone a lot when I'm out and about, um, and I have no um, reservations about anyone who does that. Uh, but um, it, it was a form to, for me uh, that I didn't, I wish I had picked it up earlier it probably would have saved me a lot of heartache <laughs> in terms of just life. Um, but it was a way that I could process. It's a way that I could process, you know, everything I was going through. Um, you know, we'll talk, if you want to ask about it, you can't, the, the addiction. And um, it was a way to get through those moments um, and, and, and kind of not, uh, not subject anyone else to what I was trying to do. Um, or what I was feeling, um, and it it was it was a way con to connect um, to my environment. Um, you know, it was um, it was a way to. I mean, I was taking photographs of you know mailboxes on farm roads and and ad address plates and license plates and it just you know I look back on it, but I it was a really joyous time in my life 
in photography. Uh, there was no other eyes on it. Um, and it, it was a way to record what I was going through. Um, I, I think about that uh, photograph of um, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman that was taken, I think it's Sundance. And I think it was the last photo taken of him. And uh, it was just, I, I, I apologize, I don't know the lady's, the woman's name, but she does all that the glass um, box uh, camera. And uh, she was taking photographs of him. And his is just so sad. And, uh, and I wonder like if he had had the ability to look at himself and that would that have changed anything in his life? Um, so photography has always been a way for me to look at like where I'm at, how am I emotionally, how am I um, feeling about myself, around my relationships. Um, it, it's hard, I don't wanna overstate it, but I don't wanna understate it either. It's that it's made me, I think a better friend, a better father, um, and uh, those things matter to me. Um, and in, a lot of that's due to those early years of really seeing the power in photography. Um, not only from a standpoint of like, now it's become something different, um, but in those moments, it was really just recording. That's all it was. It was recording time and where I was at in that. Um, and uh, it, 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 again, it's not so glamorous, but it was just a practical decision. I knew I needed to express. Um, and uh, I wasn't really writing at that time, um, but it, it, and it just, it kind of, I, I, again, I don't want to understate it, don't overstate it, but it, it kind of saved me and, um, you know, it continues to. It's beautiful, oh, beautiful, because as you, as, you know, I was uh, reading some of your notes, um, it's, uh, you are very interested between the space, uh, you love the space with your, uh, with your, the subject that you are, and the time. Uh, it's it's um, it's very I think it's it's a moment of uh, every you know ev of all the dear people that you love and people that you don't know, but it's an, a very important time that you're encapsulated in that second. So it's uh, beautiful. But um, going forward, going forward, Mariam, um, I would like to to ask you your first first. We saw we followed you in all, uh, throughout, through all your uh, different exhibitions. And um, it just takes a glance at your picture, of course, to see the beauty in them, the, you know, the, the, the aesthetic. But what lies underneath each photo? Why only women and no men? Well, um, first of all, let's, let's touch upon the concept of beauty. Um, Heaven forbid we talk about beauty in the art world these days. It's taboo, you know, the uglier the better. <laughs> and and I am a great supporter of beauty. I need beauty in my life. I really do. I need it around me. It's uh, and I need to show it in my work. I'm not afraid of showing beauty in my work. I, in fact, it's my happy pill. It's my way of, I guess that's one commonality about uh, our works. I think, uh, Henry, you mentioned um, photography saving you. I think photography has saved me on many levels as well. Uh, it's been my happy pill. And I, I tend to have a life or a perspective on life, which is mostly half full rather than half empty glass, the glass being. Uh, but hence, I also, in my practice, I try to remain hopeful, I try to remain positive, I try to remain, you know, show beautiful things. So, um, um, there's a, a very famous quote, I think, which was a starting point, uh, Sappho, the, the great, you know, 600 BC um, female uh, poet, uh, artist, she was really a jack of all trades on many levels. There's a famous quote, she said, May I, may I write words more naked than flesh, stronger than bone, uh, more resilient than sinew, more sensitive than nerve. And I tried to do that. She, she was a great inspiration to me because I tried to do that with my, with my visuals, with my, with my photography. Um, 
the sublime feminine, uh, why women, you're asking. Um, I, I very much concentrated, uh, I would say about 70% of my work on the concept of the sublime feminine. It's about uh, really, it's, it's more of a philosophical appro approach to beauty. I, I was in the beauty industries, as you know, I was 10 years working with L'Oreal and Estee Lauder in my sort of more corporate career, my corporate times. Um, and it had a lot to do with, with surface beauty, you know, that, that's all we did was just, you know, show women as beautiful as they can be. Um, but I, I soon realized, you know, later on in life that, of course, I mean, it's a bit cliche to say, but, you know, a beauty in the more philosophical sense uh, goes beyond the surface. And we need, and that's the sort of exploration that, that I've been trying to embark my journey on. It's about the sublime feminine, it's a woman with a capital W, about perhaps a search for my own identity. It's about women as creator, women as creativity, women as giver of birth, um, woman, um, you know, um, as powerful, um, woman as poetess, you know, so, so the, the all encompassing definitions of what woman can be, and hence the sublime, you know, it's almost like, you know, a higher level of looking at the essence of woman. Um, and that's, um, you know, I think that's, that's what it, that's what my exploration has been about. And as I said, perhaps somewhere subconsciously, it's a search for self, you know, trying to define my own sense of identity. Um, so yes, so I've been trying to combine, you know, the beauty, the obvious aesthetics of things, of the female form, but also um, the beauty in the essence of what woman is or should be, or what I want her to be. But I think there's also a level of spirituality, right? Uh, with the concept of origins, et cetera. There's a lot of that in my depictions, as you know, and we're gonna talk about it probably. Um, there's, there's a lot of barren environments. There's a lot of return to origin with a capital O, um, perhaps some even biblical referencing. Um, my first show was called Searching for Eve in the American West. So um, 100%, I agree with you, yes. Um, so Henry, um, I had a question, but you kind of answered it uh, before. So, you know, we were talking about the, the show that I tried to curate in a virtual environment. Uh, my first attempt at curating, actually. Um, and so behind me are two mm -hmm. photos, the black and white of the man standing by the on the beach looking at the water is yours, Henry. Mm -hmm. And the uh, swimmer shimmer. Uh, which is kind of the shimmer of a woman floating in a pool is yours, Mariam. Um, and so the reason I decided to put the photos together and I found 10 different pairings uh, is that every single pair can either be a memory of a love lost or the promise of a love to come. You look at this combination, for example, this man is looking at the water and the woman is floating in a pool. However, we don't know if she's alive or dead, right? It can be interpreted because it's a shimmer. And so is he standing by the water because he's reflecting on the love of his life that has passed? Um, or is he hopeful and this image is an image of the love of his life that will appear? Um, so when you take pictures like this, Henry, um, what is going through your mind? Well, um, I... You know, I, um, I've always been, uh, well, uh, where do I start? Um, I, I think that I'm, I've always been intrigued by the hero's journey. Um, this idea that you uh, descend into this, you kind of start out with this quest and you descend into this abyss and that's where death and rebirth begin and, and then you ascend. And um, for me personally, that this photo is a, a good example of that is where I think I feel most creative in that in that abyss, in that place where there's uncertainty. Um, it's more interesting to me, you know, whether it's sadness or it, it, it's just more interesting. I'm I, I'm I can be I'm a happy guy, but in general, but I feel most at ease creating in that space. Um, I, 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 and again, it's, it's not a matter of like, I, I want to come out of those, those the time, you know, you're constantly doing this. It's never, you never like ascend to like, I've, 
you know, I'm enlightened. Um, but um, there's times where I'm resistant to leave that space because I don't want to give up how creative I feel in that space. Um, so that's that's kind of the challenge. But um, I, I love this uh, combination you have here in particular because uh, it references a lot. I mean, the real story behind uh, The Little Mermaid um, and the idea behind the tragedy of that. And, um, and, and I picked, you know, it just seems like that that's kind of there. Um, I, uh, I, I don't mind, you know, I don't mind the word sadness or do I let no more than I mind the word need. Um, I, I, you know, I find, I'll be honest, I find sadness to be more interesting, uh, for me personally, uh, than, you know, um, kind of a glee or happy. I'm content. Um, and I think there's a difference between content and happiness. Uh, but in those moments of of sadness is where I write the most. It's where I photograph the most. Uh, and I think it has generally more meaning. Um, I, and that's something I'm always going to try to process around. I don't know. I don't have any definitive thing to say in terms of explaining it. But I just know that you know, it's like, I, it, it's at that adage, you know, I don't know how to do it. I just know how it feels. And uh, uh, for me, it's just, uh, I, I hate to say comfortable, uh, but it's a very uh, easy uh, place for me to be. I don't mind being sad. Uh, I like sad music. I like sad books, um, sad movies. Um, and it, but I also love a great comedy, but that's where I really feel most inspired is, and again, I hate to, I try to dwell on my own. Um, you know, when I've taken photograph of refugees, there's no question about, you know, in Calais, there's no question about the sadness on the faces. And, and you feel almost, you're trying not to exploit it, you know? So all I know to do in that moment is to uh, internalize it. You know, how, how would I want to be photographed? What is, what is it saying to me um, instead of, you know, because uh, it, it's very easy in those situations um, to to exploit, uh, I think. I mean, it, it would be easy for me. Um, and, you know, I, it's not something I would want to do, but I think just by human nature, that kind of condition rather, you know, you, and especially as a photographer, you want to get the best shot you can but you try to be careful. When I'm on the street and I'm photographing, um, I, I'm not one to ambush. Uh, it's just not my style. I know a lot of people, it's legal and a lot of people do it really well, uh, but it's just not who I am. Uh, I try to let my intentions be known. Um, I want kind of in that moment, the only thing that bothers me about a photograph like the one behind you, it's, and I, I say bothers a strong word, um, is that there's, it's all about me in this photograph. Um, there's really no connection with this the subject. He doesn't know I'm there. Um, and uh, but I, 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 there are times where uh, I've been in, you know, wherever I've lived and I've been on the street and I let my intentions be known. And there's something magical that happens in that moment uh, because if they're agreeing to it, like they're, they're okay with it and it's hard to miss, you know, our cameras. Um, when they're agreeing, all of a sudden there becomes a partnership. Um, it no longer is me taking me taking something from it. It's uh, it becomes something that uh, we put together um, together, and uh, that's always those those are those are seldom moments, but they're magic. They're, it's real magic. I'd actually use the word sadness, turmoil, um, melancholy. Mm -hmm describing your photos in my in the question I was going to ask, but mm -hmm. I think it's a byproduct of black and white photography, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I looked at a lot of your photographs and they're mostly black and white. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny because when they are in colors, they seem more impersonal than in black and white. Um, well, I think that, <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I really admire color photography. Um, I don't do it. Um, I I don't do it out of just um, 
I need to learn to do it more. Um, I need, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here saying, well, I just do black and white. Um, uh, using color is, and this is why, like, Miriam's photographs are so moving to me in, that in the color, is that she's so, I, she, I can't, I don't want to speak for her, but my, my, my impression is that she's very comfortable in that. And it shows she's very good at it. Um, where I just, I'm not very good at color. You know, I'm just not very good at it. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that, um, uh, again, back to that, my goal is to express. Um, it's not really to take necessarily, some of my favorite photos are really not very good photos, but I know that how I felt that day around it. And, um, but it's easier for me to express in black and white. It, I don't have to, uh, worry about I, even when I do color uh, the first thing I do when I'm processing is is you know tone it down mute it you know just really bring it down you know the saturation down um, and I know that's just the product of not confident enough in that that uh, technique um, but I do think that uh, uh, you know I was in LA and you know, I was taking photographs, just a couple of portraits, and I did color, and uh, it was kind of freeing a little bit. But uh, um, yeah, but I, I do feel most comfortable in black and white. And if it, if it's sad, it comes off sad. Um, I can see how that would be interpreted that way. Um, Francois, if I may interject, in fact, to answer to both of you. Um, the only time I started using color was um, during COVID and post COVID. And that was really interesting to me because I always did black and white. I was very conscious choice and con conscious decision to do black and white. But during COVID, I think this sort of, um, the way we were all um, somewhat incarcerated, both physically and mentally, uh, and then being let out of jail effectively in a, in a way, I, I felt the need for life and connection to nature. And it all started with nature actually. Um, during a three-day trip to Capri, where I was completely taken back by the beauty and the color of space and place in that island, and this absolute recognition of need um, to connect nature with water, with sky, and and trees and leaves, and you know, I, I kind of became one with that, and it was the first time I recognized that need in my life, um, and hence when I started taking uh, pictures in color to add that positivity, that sort of love form um, within my work. So just a little comment on the side. It's funny how COVID changed everything I we were photographing. Um, to your point, being isolated and being quarantined, we were just, I mean, you, I can't tell you how many times I walked through where I was living just trying to find something, you know, to, to photograph. And it's amazing what you can do in those situations, but yeah. I think it was also a moment for all of us to to reflect and uh, but also to to you know to to understand how beautiful around us we don't have to go too far and to understand you know that local and not you know global it's almost uh, next to us instead of. Uh, going so I, I can reflect with uh, with Mariam to Capri of course I come from there and we're all about sun color <laughs> we live with this color I think it's also uh, it's uh, it's um, but again at the same time you know it's it's so beautiful as Francois put them you know your, your uh, Henry and the Mariams together it's 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 uh, so poetic there are two worlds but they're connected to each other it's uh, it's with the invisible thread that you have there and it's so beautiful i have to say i'm as i said i was in the in the space yesterday and i got lost into both of your worlds it was so touching so we can't wait but uh back to 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 mariam uh, as you can see here that you you always um there is an architectural quality to your art yes mariam whatever the curves of the women's bodies or the angles of the macros of your linear motion series 
in the shadows projected? Is it, is it geometry or storytelling? It's a bit of both, really. I, I have genuine interest in architecture, genuine. You know, I love interiors and I love, um, the first thing I do when I go to a new city is actually, uh, if there's one available, do an architectural tour of the city. So architecture, you know, weighs very heavy. Design weighs very heavy in my head. I love interior spaces, um, but also love interior um, uh, human spaces, if you on the emotive side. And, and I think at the end of the day, um, marrying this interest in, in architecture, geometry, a linearity, curve, curvy linearity in the, in the, in the um, form of a female form, effectively. Um, I boil it all together. And I think there's a deep desire to continuously try and um, boil things down, whether it's a concept, a female figure, a landscape, a space, a city, into its bare essence. And I think in doing that, you, um, you dig out all the fluff, you know, and you just bear it, literally boil it down to its bare essentials. Um, bare in the, in, the, in the case of a, of a figure, uh, bare essentials in the case, for instance, I was in Palm Springs recently and I, I was so, I'd never been there. So it was this first time sort of encounter and I was taken aback by mid-century architecture and I was taken aback by uh, the, the color essence, the, you know, this vivid color presence, which is almost like saccharine sweet. Uh, it's almost surreal. The whole place is like a little bubble of its own. And it was like stepping into this sort of fantasy land or, it, you know, if Henry, you and I talk about, you know, uh, our childhood uh, favorite game, which was Candyland. It was like stepping into Candyland. And it, it's a very, very odd concept. So, so yeah, so I boiled it down to its essence and started playing around these puzzle forms, you know, uh, taking a bit of this, a bit of that and putting it all together and creating a story around that. So, and I, I put it on Instagram and it had, I never had intentions of having this level of positive response to it, but people really picked up on it. And there's been great interest in those Forms. I did it in Greece as well, where you're so taken by the blue, the white, and it's all to do with form. It's, it, you know, whether it's circular forms, I, you see the evil eye, you know, which is in my culture. I see it in the, cir the circular forms in Greece. You see it in the linearity of, you know, the architecture and the, the, the way the houses are built. And the whole place just became blue and white. And I, I, it almost becomes obsessive. <laughs> I keep going, you know, I, I may spend a whole day just going around snapping, 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 and then putting it all together like a puzzle. And perhaps it's a way of helping me remember the place, you know, help me in my own collective memory or, or and then help share it, of course, out there. Um, and then on the black and whites, I would say, you know, um, the first time I boiled it down to its essence was when I went to um, Edward Weston's home in Carmel in California. And it was the first time that I honed in on the body as opposed to featuring body, in, which is what I usually like to do. And I, that's where I think I learned how to paint with light. It, it had referencing to my older days of learning how to print photographs in a dark room and how you paint with light. Um, and hence the black and white and those, you know, varying grades, shades of gray. Um, again, what you're trying to do is just bear, you know, really honing down on the bare essentials. And I honed in on the female form, on the female body. And as you have said, you know, sometimes it's really not obvious what it is. It's just a, a referencing, it's an essence of. Um, and I leave it to the imagination of the viewer to you know, just ponder what that may be. That's, that's really my story behind the body architecture or the, you know, the, the linear approach to space and place and human. That, that's, that's actually my, was my other question. That you answered to. No, it's, it's beautiful because, you know, it's, it's, the bodies become landscape and landscape become body. So at the, at the end, it's, uh, it's so beautiful that, but what but, you, yes they're so, one you know they're one. human and nature are one i mean there is you know going back to the biblical referencing 
from ashes to ashes. You know, that that's basically what it is. It's like we are at one with nature. And and this is the concept, you know, obviously we're desperately trying to to make this work as humanity. Well, you know, good people try and do that. Um, and then others are fighting it. But, you know, we we, we are absolutely one. And, the, you know, the, 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 the first time I had a proper, proper recognition of this landscape, you know, this architecture bodies becoming one with architecture, almost losing themselves in space and place mm -hmm. was actually in New Mexico near Abiquiu, which is where Jojo Keefe's home and ranch was. And I was so taken aback by, by the nature, by imposing, the imposing nature of this nature that surrounded me. And um, I just imagine, you know, what this woman, Jojo Keefe, um, her courageous act of going out there when she did, you know, all the way back then. Um, and and I, the, the nature of the photography I took were you know, these, these bodies lost amidst the rocks, you know, becoming one with the rocks. Um, and then there was the second um, moment where I went to, um, to, to upstate New York. Um, and uh, I, I, I did a lot of um, shoots outside in nature, you know, with body forms. And because the light was so strong, it created a great deal of contrast and it surprised me. So, you know, the female form lying down became almost like when you multiplied them, and I was working with four models at the time, they almost became like sand dunes. You know, when I, when I processed the, the photographs, it became like sand dunes. And, and again, you know, where does, it, where does it stop? Where does it end? Where does the figure stop and nature begins? Um, where does form stop and, you know, the actual flesh begins? Um, it's, it's really all kind of melded in one, in my head anyway. I love these these contrasts. I love these hostile environments as well, where you have this curvilinearity of the female form contrasted with quite hostile environments, which were quite mm -hmm. almost like original kind of landscapes, you know, what earth could have looked like, you know, at the origin of mankind. And I like playing with the, those types of uncomfortable tensions necessarily where you know, you have very arid, very barren environments with life, the female form. Um, and, and I like playing with those types of tensions as well, visually, so. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. I, sorry, Carolina, I was paraphrasing you as you were saying it. <laughs> <laughs> this, the same, as I say, I, I, and we remember, Mario, because we, we had some of your beautiful picture at the beginning with your um, early works that you did with the nature. I think there was one in Ireland that you did. Yes, in Iceland, um, absolutely. This this nude form, yeah, uh, which was... is the moss hills in Iceland. I mean, Iceland. I I don't know whether you've been or not, but it literally is like you know lunar landing. It's 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 crazy. It's uh, it's something which was so extraordinary. You know, something that was so unlike what I had ever seen before. Um, and no, no human in sight, just rolling hills of moss, green moss, and every rolling hill, and it's very recurring, very, you know, um, repetitive. I just saw female body after female body. I saw Eve after Eve after Eve after Eve. So I married Eve with the, with the landscape. And um, of course you have the contrast of, you know, very pure, um, skin white alabaster like with this very deep moss um very desolate environment and you you know and i kept thinking even while i was shooting you know how is it possible to have life in such a dead space um uh, and yet you know moss is is regenerative you know it's it's land it's rich it's volcano ashes you know which regenerate this moss and and then of course you go from this sort of negative contrast into a positive combination and it it you know it's very meditative i think you know it's it's uh, quite self-serving sometimes when i photograph um it's um it's a, it's a selfish act which kind of helps me in my own process and my own life and sort of um you know maybe i don't do yoga but 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 uh placing myself in these types of, you know, big sky, uh, the American West, you know, desolate space being Iceland, uh, sometimes in Provence in places where I've been, it, it helps me um, recenter 
myself, you know, and be present in the now and in sync of where I am in my life. And, and it kind of comes out in this um, funny, weird and wonderful ways, visually speaking. So. so very interesting, actually, because that's another commonality between you and Henry, because that's kind of what Henry was saying before, right, about the processing, the process being about how he feels, um, you know, the way to check in with how he feels when he took the photos, etc. So again, a commonality between the two of you. Uh, so that, that leads me to my next question, Henry. Uh, and uh, I would say the first part is taken out of context uh, because it was actually more on the commercial side of your website. Mm -hmm. when you write, I truly love every photo I take, capturing those magical moments that we cherish, but far too often missed. Uh, some people will actually say that if you spend your time taking photos, you miss what's happening around you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but now that I've heard what you've said about how photo makes you feel, uh, what moments have you missed in your life? Um, due to photography? Uh, due to... Uh, um, in general, the ones that you wish you would have captured and, the, and that you didn't? Um, have no, there's... I, I would... I, I see what you're. I see what you're saying. I do, um, and I can see how easy that would be. You know, um, uh, there's you know, that's the reason I didn't photograph my own son's wedding. You know, I took some shots um, that I kind of wanted to get, but I wanted to stay present it, it, with that. But I would, I I might make the argument that, um, or the point that, the cameras actually brought me closer. Uh, more present uh, in moments, uh, really more aware. Uh, you have to hone in, you, you know, you, um, uh, and it, it helps me like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, discern like uh, between the white noise and really the, the poignant uh, thing. So yeah, I I, it's actually, I think made me a little bit more present um, it, I mean, I, I can only speak to my intention. Um, someone might might see it differently, but uh, it I've always felt more in tune uh, with another. Um, and again, I'm not someone, um, quite honestly, I'm not someone that is, my disposition is not to approach uh, or not to engage. You know, um, my uh, sibling, my it's actually my younger sister told me one time I have the worst resting face she's ever seen. Um, and I think it's by design, uh, but uh, the camera kind of breaks through that for me. You know, it's like, um, it, it kind of helps me engage more um, when, again, I, I'm, I'm comfortable where I'm at, like how I am. Uh, but I also know that the camera gives me this ability to um, not only see, I mean, I, it's not even looking through the viewfinder. It's like when you're looking for a photograph, you're engaged with everything around you. Um, and uh, so in that way, I, I would say that um, it's actually been this, this incredible tool uh, to kind of aid me along the way, if you will, uh, in those connecting moments. So, would you say that your photography is more um, very much spontaneous or is it something that you prepare in advance? Um, no, it, you know, that's that's a great question. I think about this all the time. Um, it's more spontaneous. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I would like to try more, you know, more controlled. You know, I would like to take a, take a shot at that. Um, but uh, it is more spontaneous. You know, I, I've often said, and I, you know, Mary and I, Miriam and I have talked about this before. It's like you go to a place and you go, you're looking for the shot and you, you have in your head what you want. You, you, you're going to a destination and the shot's never really the shot. Like there's always something else you see. Like you go there for one reason, you go there for one thing and then uh, you're there, you find yourself there for another I'm, I'm i know you don't have it up but then there's that that hut on the hillside overlooking the atlantic well i went there to shoot the lighthouse which is just to the uh west of of where that uh hut is and um you know 
you get there and you're going to take your obligatory lighthouse shot. And uh, I saw that hut. And uh, all of a sudden that becomes, you know, it, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to be there. And so I think in that way, you have to be open to it. You know, or you walk away like if, because the lighthouse, it was just not a good, I mean, I, I was not making a good photograph out of it. I didn't feel like, um, but I saw the hut and it seemed just more humble. Um, but there was a strength in that. And uh, so all of a sudden that was, that, that was my takeaway from that morning. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So You're it's right. just, again, it's just more spontaneous. Yeah, um, which it kind of gets a, you know, it's, you have to let go of control, which is hard for me to do um, and kind of just go with it. And a lot of days you're going to find nothing um, due to it. But um, you know, when you do find something, you know, like that man on the shore, um, you know, I didn't plan on that. You know, it's, it just happens. Yep. That's what happens when you let go of control and release to the universe. Mm -hmm. that's it exactly yeah spontaneity it's the best i think mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sometimes not maybe <laughs> we have to okay but uh, at this point we discuss about photography and uh, who are the humans behind the camera so for the next very special issue of the art talk magazine uh, francois curated your picture as a series of 10 dialogues uh, between your respective to which he writes in his introduction. Francois, I'm paraphrasing you, which I, I adore this, this uh, few words. Every conversation can be interpreted as a love loss or the promise of a love to come. What does love mean to you both? Mariam. So I quote, going back to my own, um, origin, the incursion, I cannot help but to uh, make a reference to a Rumi quote, which I've always loved regarding love. And it says, um, your task is not to seek love, but merely to seek, find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Um, love is, uh, to me, it's, it's surrender. It's everything. It's a huge contrast as well. Love is being one, of course, but love is also allowing each other, whether it's an amorous love, whether it's family love, it's also allowing each other to, to, be, to be free, independent, and to respect that independence. And, and yet you have these contrasts, right? So love actually is impossible. <laughs> and yet it's possibility. Um, love is prediction because it goes against love you know your logic and your heart you these two are constantly battling each other in love so uh, it's it's everything and it's nothing and it's uh i i love i i work a lot with gilbert and george i photograph them a lot they have something they they have one line which i love it's uh, love always a l w um a y s and all ways a w a l l w a y s um my definition of love for you. <laughs> Bellissimo. <laughs> as, the, as the expression goes, le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît pas. Bravo. Voilà. Exactement. C'est le conflit éternel, right? It's an eternal, it's an eternal uh, fight between reason and heart and heart and reason and you never know, you never quite know which no. one to... <laughs> yeah. I think there's... Yes. One voice side is louder than the other. Um, I, I think the most difficult concept to understand, and I don't know if we can tie it back to uh, photography, uh, is the concept of unconditional love. As, as, as selfish as we are fundamentally as humans uh, and somewhat self-centered, right? Different degrees. How is unconditional love possible? That's, that's your homework for the two of you. Next photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still need to hear what does love mean to Henry. When the question was posed, I was, wow. Okay. Um, I think, I, 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 I apologize that I can't credit the statement or the quote, but I'll kind of sum it up is that 
the author was kind of saying that we we try to say, okay, there's love you have for your children, there's love you have for your spouse or, or a significant other, or there's love for your parent, your siblings. We have all these ways of like, you know, um, parceling it out. And um, their contention was that, no, there's just love. There's just love. Um, do I love a stranger more or less than I love my children? In a perfect world, I'd like to say I love everyone. Um, I think where I get, my definition is that I work towards that kind of love where, uh, you know, I, I want it for everyone. I think what I do with my children is I'm more committed to them. Mm -hmm. I know them better. I, I, there's less conditions, you know, if there's any with the, you know, when you have with your children, um, I, I, but do I love less someone who I, you know, I'm in North Paris shooting a refugee or an immigrant down in West Texas. I, do I love them less? That's a hard, that's a, a slippery slope. If I say, well, I, I don't love them as much. Um, uh, but I understand, and, and I, I don't want to get confused. It's like, you know, if, if it's a matter with my children is that using them as an example is that uh, I have a relationship with them. You know, I, I know them. I enjoy our conversations. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, they're part of me. Um, and, but I'm not sure that that is all that love is. Um, I, uh, I, I, I get caught up a little bit in the idea that, um, I guess to simplify it would be say like, well, I love you, but I don't know you kind of thing. Um, and, uh, but in my, my deepest hope is that, um, and I don't, I'm not trying to oversimplify anything, but sometimes that helps me process is that, you know, I just know that the people I love are the people that I, if they weren't there, I would miss, you know, that I, they would be notedly missed. Um, and um, I can get juvenile about that. I, you know, I have an immature heart at times and I guess that's, I'm okay with that. Um, I still believe in a pure love. I still believe in true love. I still believe in all of it. Um, my, my issues around love, I'm really not too jaded about. I don't feel like I am. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I know that, uh, there's a fierceness in love. Like, it's not just, um, part of us that goes, well, you mean a lot to me or you, I hold space for you. No, I think there's a fierceness in it. Um, and there's a bravery in it. Um, there's a risk. And if you're willing to take that risk, that kind of says love to me. Um, if someone's willing to like take a chance on me, that says love to me. I feel loved in those moments. Um, it's a loaded question. I get it. And I'm, we're trying to answer in a short time, but um, I know again, we, um, I touched on it with photography is that I can't define love. But I just know how it makes me feel. Um, and if I, you know, it's that, I'm not the religious sort, but that idea that if you try to define God, you limit him or her. And I, I, I feel the same. I feel identical about that paraphrase with love. If I try to define it, I've limited it mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that, but I, I'm not just <laughs> listen, you know, I've gotten caught up into, you know, the, 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 the more primal um, notions of love Um but, you know, as I've gotten older, I kind of worked through that a little bit, gotten better at it. Um, I think like love, like anything you do in life, it's like something you're constantly evolving around. So, you know. It's the concept, you know, is love finite, infinite? Do you love because of despite? Um, all these questions. I mean, I think we should, we could all get together and around some, mm -hmm. you know, some very cool iced tea and have a very, very long conversation. Yeah. But let's make it, um, I'm going to give you a little homework very quickly, Henry. Mm -hmm. um, and to go beyond uh, what you usually do with photography. 
uh, if you were to photograph nudes, which you may have, mm -hmm. what those photos look like? Um, I, I <laughs> oh, did you, was, was, were you asking me? Yeah. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I am, um, okay. I, I think that uh, I, I've only done it a couple of times and it's been kind of, it's never been staged. Um, really, it was pretty much impromptu. Uh, but I, I think if the, the, the photographs that, that move, I mean, move me are, I don't, um, there were the ones of Marilyn Monroe where she's in bed. Uh, it's taken from above. It, Kirkland. Kirkland is the guy that photographed her. Um, and um, they're just, there's an innocence about them. And, but, you know, there's no question about the beauty. There's that contrast with her and the sheets. Um, there's a reference there. There's a suggestiveness to it um, that those photographs, I like the isolation of it, um, of course. Uh, and I, I, you know, I've really never, I've never really given it that much thought to do it. Um, and again, it's just hasn't been something I've worked towards. Uh, but I think that it would be hard for me to escape isolation. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we talk about <laughs> Miriam's point, she was talking about pretty people. And, and when I thought about like, well, nudes, it's like, how would you, do, I think, well, how would someone like Diane Arbus do it? You know, how would, you know, it's, and again, I, it's not a matter of touring Bedlam. I don't want that. I don't want that. I, that's not really what I'm a, want to do. But I think there is something to be said about celebrating, um, you know, just the human form. And it's, I, you know, it, uh, one of the things that Miriam touched on was that, that form in the desert. Um, and uh, there's something that intrigues me about that. Um, I once read that um, minimal rooms work because um, people call them cold and all, you know, however you look at it. Um, but the reason they work so well, if they're done well, is that the people in the room become the hero shot, the heroes. You know, it's not a painting on the wall. It's not a, you know, Voss on the, on the, on the, on the table, it becomes the people in the room. Uh, and I, I, I think that would be a launching, kind of a launching, you know, point from where I would go with that is how do I do that? Um, and I think also with me, it, um, again, it's like my photographs um, can be very simple and I, it helps me process it. You know, it helps me see things more clearly. Um, I, I see more clearly in those moments. So. But, but I think we can say that about certain of Mariam's photos. Uh, some of the black and white nudes are actually very simple. They really are down mm -hmm. to, to a figure, to, you know, to a shape. Um, Definitely. Because well, when I think about nudes, right, um, <clears throat> for me it's a very intimate it's not something that you share with anybody right mm -hmm. uh, that guy who goes to the sauna butt naked and just lets him hang loose at all <laughs> not happening, never. Um, but for example i'd love to take pictures of somebody i really care about right but then mm -hmm. you know the concept of beauty is in the eye of the beholder right mm -hmm. and so i may want to take a picture because i think she's the most beautiful and most desirable woman in the world but then mm -hmm. she can go oh my god do you know what I mean? So how do you reconcile all those things? Uh, mm -hmm. And what I'm learning from talking to the two of you today is when you look at photography in general, right? Mm -hmm. The first impression is that you as photographers or artist photographers are trying to capture something external to share with us, like a painting. But when in fact, it's actually a very personal process that talks a lot more to how you feel about that photo rather mm -hmm. than how it's going to affect, right? Yeah, I, th I think that um, uh, when, I've, when I take my best photos um, and that it's subjective, you know, I'm, I'm, when I, I'm talking about my own thoughts on it is um, 
when I've been most clear about the way I'm feeling. Um, and I, you know, and I'm okay with the ones that are not. I'm processing. And so the photograph should reflect that. But absolutely, um, it's a very personal thing. Uh, I've someone I used to work with referred to it as expressive photography. And uh, you know, it was neither commercial nor it was really just in. You know, if you, you know, not that an example is um, just my Instagram feed where it's just a diary. It's I'm not trying to set the world on fire with anything or, you know, it's the words and, and the image. It's like it's all just kind of wet clay. Um, and uh, but, yeah, I've, I've been most it, I've been most certain uh, when I've been most certain uh, is when I feel like it's reflected in the photograph. Um, but again, it's, you can't, I can't plan it. So, um, in my, you know, in my situation, you know, in, in the way I, in my style, um, you know, I go out and I look, I, I, I can see it right away. You know, I'm look. you know, when I do see it, I see it right away. I don't, um, there's no hesitation. Um, but I do agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And so tomorrow, if I may, I'm sorry, Caroline, I can just ask one very quick question. Um, um, so your your photography, at least the one we get to see, right, uh, is a lot more planned, prepared. Um, but taking to what Henry has just said, have there been times where you've been back at home and you kind of develop your photos and you realize that, wow, I didn't realize I was in that state of mind that day that I'm now seeing that I took a shot completely differently than I thought I would. So actually, um, very much so. Um, I may do a bit of research prior to going to a place because I like um, building around stories that interest me, as I said. And the initial um, uh, catalyst can be, you know, line of poetry. It could be a film. It could be anything, right? Piece of piece of literature um, that I may have read, and then something may have stuck in my mind, and then I go. For instance, let's take the example of. The latest show that I had in London, um, If Only These Walls Could Talk, which was shot at the Norpinus Hotel because I was just so taken by that space and place, its um, relationship with art history and what had taken place in that hotel. Hotels really intrigue me in general. Because I think hotels see a lot um, and they live a lot. But once I get to that place, whether it's the desert, whether it's the hotel, whether it's uh, unexpected, um, you know, a journey into any kind of space or place, I let go of that research, my notes of everything. And I become incredibly spontaneous in the act itself. And um, it's a very selfish act, uh, you know, to follow on what Henry was saying. I think I just follow my there's a lot of intuition there's a lot of gut feel and and that's how I start shooting and then as you're saying Francis, I get back home and the nightmare of editing begins because there is a nightmare involved with that you know there's there's five minutes of of uh <laughs> of grandiose you know, ecstasy which is when you're clicking and then you go home into the hell of editing and um <laughs> it takes months really um, to kind of boil it to the essence and it's never ever the shot that I would have thought or would have thought was pre-planned it's always that other shot and there's a great element of surprise there's always the unexpected it's things that I I may have even shot while I was there and didn't even think twice about it but then when I come home and I put it in the context of the narrative of the story that I'm trying to 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 sell to myself before I sell it to anyone else, um, then uh, there's the, the 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 surprise moments happen, and it's that's that's I think where the magic takes place. I think there's you know great great dose of magic that happens in photography, um, both in the editing, in the selection, in the post production work, um, adding mood, adding adding, and then. And then you go into the sort of personal psyche journey of, you know, analyzing yourself. What were you thinking? What were you trying to achieve? What you took out of it? Did, did it affect you in a certain way? Will you affect people once they see this? 
how how is their reaction going to be versus your own does it even matter you know um yeah so very interesting this is actually one of my favorite art talks because it's a shift change in how i i look at an art form actually it's very interesting thank you very very cool very revelatory for me as well um even talking about it is is quite revelatory i find oh no absolutely i mean because what you really talk about it you know it's emotions and, and actions that you that, that you feel or express or you know indulge yourself uh, but you never really talk it's almost like st sitting in a confessional <laughs> you, you know, that lawyer exhibitionist duality yes. yeah. you think, i think there's also those photos that um you take you were you know that were kind of a secondary shot you thought um, or you, I'll just take, I'll just click this. I'll, you know, and when you first get back and you're looking at it and you're editing and you're thinking, ah, nah, nah, you just, you pass right by it. But there's something that happens maybe after six months or two years. And, um, I like to think that, and I, when I do like a workshop, I try to tell people to be patient with them because there's some part of you that kind of grows into them you know maybe what you were what you were photographing then didn't resonate with you then but when you go you, you I'm constantly going through old photographs of mine that I think well there's something there you know I can see it now when at the time I was like it was on you know it was on the printer room floor I didn't I didn't want it um so I think there's that part of it that Mary seemed to like I I think she can resonate with her is that or it may resonate with her is that those those photographs you just can't discount anything that you you've exposed or something was there that you saw you take it especially in the day of digital on a practical standpoint there's no reason not to take it <laughs> there's absolutely no reason um it, it's 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 you know it's space on a memory card um you're not you're not burning through film or anything other um, than look at thousands of photos versus dozens of photos right yeah. yeah that's exactly it and i'm the worst about that um you know i've got friends and that oh they'll shoot 50 100 of just one shot one still life type thing um i'll do two <laughs> you know and it's 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 not it's never served well but it to my in my defense, it's normal. Normally, I only have one shot at it. You know, it's 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 on the street or this guy on the shore behind you. I only have one shot at it. It's not like I can, you know, stay you know stay with them there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Carolina, you're muted. I'm actually the one doing fifty thousand, <laughs> and then I I need I cannot uh, delete, and I have to make myself be brave to delete them because i think it's it's as you said you you think of one shot and then it's uh, especially you know when it's about your family your children and and you see them as you said henry a couple of months after and you're like okay but this is actually looks better mm -hmm. now than before so i will keep it too <laughs> so, but it's a, it's a, the only problem with digital pictures i have to tell it's the albums you know which my mother oh yeah loved before and it's so difficult because anyway that's another story but uh mariam my uh one one last question because i know you have a busy busy schedule and uh what is the most intimate photo that you ever taken and it is uh, represent for you something very special uh, i hesitate between two but um let me start with the the first one which really uh meant lot to me to my career to me personally and it, in fact i called it it was the first time i even used the terminology of the sublime feminine it is a photograph called the sublime Feminine. it's about this woman um who's sitting in a fetal position um on a on a rock and it's in taken it was photographed in the Bois de provence um in provence in france uh, in fact it's near uh the the famous hospital saint paul de mosul where uh, Van Gogh spent his last year there and, and famously painted his best 150 paintings in that location. 
Um, it was very unique because it was a, um, it is, I mean, it's not was, it is an abandoned bauxite quarry. And it just so happens that I found out post factum, I didn't know it at the time when I was photographing, I found out post factum that it was also the location where Jean Cocteau filmed his famous film in 1962, Le Testament d'Orphée. And I have to say that without knowing that, there was something very mythical about that space. And uh, we were playing around, we never use artificial lighting. And we were in this cave basically, and there were natural cracks. So the sunlight was coming through these natural cracks. And I, I found this natural platform of, of rocks and I placed the figure on the rocks. And as the light was shining through from above, there was a slight movement. I think there was a bird or something above and it just shattered dust on her body. And this dust just started floating down and I shot, it was a moment I shot. And when I discovered my own photograph back when I went back to the hotel, I realized that it was like this fetal position, female figure floating in the cosmos. You know, it, it really was again, going back to the origin <laughs> of, of mankind, of, of birth, of, you know, even us, Earth, within the wider scape of the universe, um, what, what we're doing here. It made me think a lot. And it really was a very, very intimate moment. Intimate while taking it, but also intimate in the post-production um, uh, section, you know, phase, I guess, of the, photo, the, the, of, the, of, the photo, of the photo, where it just made me think a lot about um, our space as humans, you know, within this greater universe. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and again, the, the light, you know, that black and white, the light, the way the light hit her, the way these, um, you know, shards of stone were just floating in the air. It really was quite, um, the ashes, you know, it, it sort of made me think about a lot. And then the second image, uh, which a little bit is related, was taken during COVID in the middle of lockdown in London, St. James's. I was working with an Italian um, ballet dancer, uh, Michael, Michaela Meazza, who was a wonderful prima in London. Um, and we just took on the streets, you know, at midnight um, near, near Christmas. And uh, imagine the most populated area of London entirely given to us, you know, it was my space. It was my, uh, I don't know, it was like a, a theater almost. It was, it was incredible. It was an incredible moment of marrying you know, dance, life and desolation in, in one space and place. And she was just twirling and whirling, almost in a, in, a, in a trance really. And just being able to witness that moment of life within a very, you know, death oriented environment or atmosphere, negative, you know, dark, um, was incredible. And then we got caught by the police and they made us go home, but uh, we weren't doing anything illegal. I mean, you know, London was not under strict lockdown. Uh, we were just, adding a bit of poetry to both our, but um, very intimate, very, very intimate moment. I, I remember you told me <laughs> about, yeah, it, was, it, it must have been incredible, incredible. It's, uh, you know, I, beautiful, you know, to, 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 to and, um, you know, I, I feel so touched about, you know, you know, we could actually leave while you're describing it also with Henry, when you describe your picture, it's so incredible. And Henry, I know that Francois has also another question for you, but which one? Can you tell us also what is your most oh. intimate? Yeah, no, no, I, it's without a doubt. I know exactly which one it is. Um, it's, uh, it's one of a, uh, I was in uh, Paris in a metro um, and uh, uh, it was the uh, Guy, it doesn't matter. Um, it was in North Paris, um, up near Sacre Coeur, and um, I uh, there was a I don't know the relationship between the two, but there was an older woman, uh, and uh, she was Northern African or something along probably those lines, and uh, uh, she had an amazing regal look to her, 
and she was with this young child, a girl, I'd say six years old, maybe. And um, there was a moment where the lady was kind of just had her arm to the side and she kind of had a kind of a kind of a what would you call it like a like a hitch in her kind of lean you know there was a certain strength in that and the little girl just put her forehead against the woman's wrist um and I was just happened to be right there right then and just clicked it um it was crazy I was had the camera out because I was looking at other photos and then I took it but it's when I consider you know photos that okay I was the right place right time and I didn't screw it up <laughs> um that's it I there was an intimacy there between them I felt there was it was so intimate in a way to me that I felt like I had walked in on this kind of moment between these you know this kind of protective uh stature next to this very vulnerable young girl and um but that is I there's a couple of things I wish I did you know wish I'd taken more of them of that but it that was absolutely my without a doubt my favorite photograph that I've taken um uh I yeah that would be it I don't really I I you know I, I there's others I like but nothing in my my mind or my heart that competes with that I remember we had that picture uh in the article we did um on you in the magazine I, I yeah remember. yeah it, it just I, I can look at it today and and just uh, look at feel like and I, and you know again I'm not I can't speak to everybody's perception of it but mine has always been uh it's it's when I guess you know and that was taken in 2000 maybe 18 something like that and mm -hmm. uh it was a real uh to you know to be self-serving it was a real moment of when I thought you know build on that that's what you need to build on you know um that's something where you're not you know you 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 know it kind of led to everything which i think all photos kind of lead to the next one even our bad ones are lean you know helping you can't get around them you know you got to go through them um uh, i value those as much as i do any photo i've taken all the bad ones um and i'm sure that you know those someday i'll the ones i take now that i don't really care about you know i got to give them their, their tribute you know to what they what they you know what they give me and to you, Mariam, I, I know exactly the, the the photo you were talking about with this woman in the fetal position with the dust falling down. I mean, it's got a quasi-celestial, ethereal quality to it. Um, and I'm always amazed, um, you know, and I look at uh, I saw Carolina's pictures when she shares them. Um, and it's actually incredible how sometimes you capture a moment and people are like, oh, yeah, no, that's Photoshop. You're like, no, it's not. This is just life happening. And I think that's what you can capture with photo that you can't with painting or any other medium uh, is you can actually show how beautiful life is as it happens. No enhancements or steroids necessary, right? <clears throat> of stop, look, and as I always like to say, choose love, right? Because mm -hmm. once you choose love and you get rid of anger and all those things, it becomes a lot clearer, right? And in my view, that's the future of photography. That's the true future of pure photography. If we're going to retain this art form as an art form, I think we all need to focus on its purity and its genuineness, its authenticity. And um, that's where you, I think you're gonna need to make these differentiations versus AI, versus, um, uh, you know, post-production where there's so much post-production in terms of, you know, add additions, extraction. That's, that's just nonsense in my view, you know, in my view, where you judge a good photograph is, is how and when it was taken in its pure form. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that to me is real. The yeah. rest is creation of a different sort. And, you know, it, it, there's room for everyone in this world, thankfully. Um, I'm a great believer in, in coexistence, but if you're going to call something photography, 
it's got to be that. Yeah, agreed. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, we were talking with Carolina yesterday. Um, I was reading an article on human intelligence versus machine intelligence and the comparison technique, what they can do, et cetera, et cetera. And then it dawned on me. I'm like, but hang on. We're having all these technical discussions. What do we have to agree on is well, what is the end goal for humanity? What is it that we're actually trying to achieve until we decide what's better? What is it? Is it optimization for greed? Um, is it optimization for humanity to live in peace? But nobody talks about that, right? So yeah. with photography, it's the same. I've been, I've been seeing so many photographers post on LinkedIn. Oh, look how cool my photos look with a little AI. I'm like, but it's not your photo anymore. And by the way, I would also argue with regards to Henry's work, if I may, because I think I, what attracted me to Henry's work to start off with was actually this marriage of word and image, because I think his work very much involves the word. Um, it's not image alone. It's not word alone. It's the combo together that really gives it its strength. And I was just thinking the other day, you know, what, you know, I talk to my kids, they, they are using things like chat GBT, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at that, you know, poetry is being written through chat GBT, you right. give it all the information mm -hmm. supposedly and they, you know, spurs out, but, you know, I could never imagine chat GBT <laughs> to write the type <laughs> of sentences or expressing the feelings that Henry expresses in his work, because how could it? You know, how could it replicate every ounce of DNA and every ounce of memory that he's experienced as a human? And, you know, and that and he does it daily as in a diary format. Um, it's so guttural. It's so, you know, from it's so visceral. It's so it's so human. <laughs> it's so human. I think that's the way to say it, that, you know, I can't ever imagine any kind of computerized version of um it, it will just never be that, or I maybe I'm maybe I'm too old, maybe it's generational, maybe maybe, but I refuse to to, to give in to that. Uh, you know, again, I was I was laughing when you talk about poetry because uh, Caroline has a very um, distinct experience from just a few days ago about that. Do you want to share that story very quickly? <laughs> yes, my son, who <laughs> he starts reading a beautiful poem and I was of course amazed because he never reads <laughs> and, uh, but he, I didn't understand it was about this was it was about this artificial um, intelligence uh, poetry so he gave some words and they created this uh, incredible incredible but this for me okay we're laughing but you know it makes only you know it's it's shocking that for our next generation, children, children, teenagers are not going to read. It it creates only a laziness on, you know, using a phone and uh, creating a poem, which, which okay. If, of course, I, I was happy. I have to say that for once he, <laughs> he said something so beautiful. It was about <laughs> one of the mothers. So <laughs> I think. Honestly, I, I maybe I'm a you know conspiracy. I, I don't know it's a conspiracy theory or whatever it is, but I really think that there's some greater being out there that's trying to dumb down humanity, that's trying to dumb down society, and I think us as humans need to fight this. You know, we yeah. uh, you know it's um, it's very very disturbing to me. It's something that you know bothers me daily because of course we're surrounded by it, and 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 yet I know deep down that this is something we're going to have to give in somehow into because that's just nature of the beast. And I think this uh, genie or, or monster in my case, the way I view it has been sort of unleashed from its bottle, but um, it's something that is incredible yeah. and concerning creativity and, and, and the brain potential and, and education. And, and yeah. Uh, my thought is about to die. Uh, so I'm going to go and try and find my charger. But so I have a question for Henry. Um, mm -hmm. It's going be also going to be about intimacy, but slightly differently. Um, addiction, rehab, rock bottom describes part of your past uh, in your own words. Mm -hmm. What words would you like to describe your future? Um, I, you know, I, 
um, it's hard for me to discern between the two in a lot of ways, and only because I say that I say that only because um, you know they're they're part of my makeup. You know, they're part of you know I, I feel no um, I don't really feel regret. I don't feel uh, ashamed. Um, it was just my journey. Um, certain actions that transpired because of it. Yes, I I do. You know, those things do tend to haunt me and they probably always will. And maybe always should. I don't know. But I think my future right now, the way I look at it right now is presently. Um, it's hard for me to look being someone in recovery um, and trying to, you know, uh, like I say, jokingly, I usually have about 360 day great days that I'm not I'm not in my head. And then there's five days a year that I'm really in bad space. Um, but I think that, uh, for me to look to the future is kind of not really where I need to be. Um, I just focus on today. Um, you know, uh, I, I love that idea in uh, recovery where you tell yourself, uh, in that really healthy manner and anyone who's dealt with, you know, alcohol or drugs or anything like that, or any kind of addiction no matter what it is, um, uh, is that you kind of have a mindset of you won't do it today and you probably won't tomorrow. But after that, I have to start the wheel rolling again. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to, I, I can't think beyond that. So um, that's personally. Artistically, there's so many things I want to do. I have so much hope for in what I want to do. Um, I've like the this this notion of words like Miriam was kind enough that what her words were about were very kind and that this idea of where does that lead you know where does this combination of the two lead how do they work together how do they feel together um, is there a more formal way to treat it than I do with like Instagram or you know kind of thing or keep it you know myself um, in journal um, but. I, I feel I've never felt more um, um, more filled with like kind of what I want to do creatively. And I, I hope that continues. You know, it's an ebb and flow thing. Nothing's linear. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm OK with that. You know, I know there's going to be times where, you know, camera sits for a month. Um, but then there's times where you're, you know, I'm out every day. Um, but I, again, it's, um, I feel more solid than I have in a long time re regarding creatively. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that being um, on kind of, you know, sand is such a bad place to be creatively either. Um, you know, it, it it's, you know, it's, you know, it's always great to have foundation, but there's times where, you know, I, I felt the most creative when, you know, back to what we were saying that I felt the most creative when I've been most, um, um, I don't know if I want to say not confused, but uh, in question, you know, Vulnerable. in flux, pardon? Vulnerable. Vulnerable. There's no question. And that's a great, thanks for saying that. You know, that's a big part of what it that I try to stay is vulnerable. What was vulnerable 10 years ago to me is not vulnerable to me now. And it's up to me to kind of keep that, you know, it's a moving target. But for me to be healthy, uh, to be creative, I need to stay vulnerable. I need to expose myself. Um, and I try to do that through both words and photography um, is to, because uh, my, my older sister, who's a fair photographer herself and she, well more than that but she uh i know there's things i post she just kind of goes oh god you know she's kind of reeling from it because she would never do it and it's not easy for me to do i can't think of a time where i was going to show somebody something that i didn't hesitate and that's good that's a good sign to me that i still feel is it it you know i've st it's still like that's a great word vulnerable mm -hmm. 
You muted. Oh, I know, I know. Bellissimo, breathtaking. And you know, we could be here all night for us. And you, it's just the morning. <laughs> so you have a long afternoon to go ahead. But thank you. Thank you, Marin. Thank you, Henry, to be so mm. vulnerable. <laughs> so mm. it, it, it was beautiful. I, I have to say, you know, when you are most, you know, through your words, through your pictures, I think we reflect, you know, our, our souls. You know, it's so poetic. Uh, Mariam and Henry, you know, I, we are your biggest fans. And uh, again, it's so beautiful to have you here with us, both of you. So thank, thank you. you, actually, Mariam, for introducing to us, Henry. Thank you very much. We will do this show in real life, no doubt, absolutely. That would be amazing. That would really, really be amazing. We'd love to work on that with you. Yes. We'll make it happen. With great, Good. it would be a, a huge honor for us. Uh, be now, this was oh. so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Really. And then really a wonderful, wonderful afternoon, wherever you are in the art world. And uh, hopefully we meet very, very soon.